hymn number nine. God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. 
have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have built your church upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Grant us so to be joined together in unity of spirit by their teaching, that we may be made a holy temple acceptable to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. A reading from the second book of Samuel. After the death of Saul, when David had returned from defeating the Amalekites, David remained two days in Ziklag. David intoned this lamentation over Saul and his son Jonathan. He ordered that the song of the bow be taught to the people of Judah. It is written in the book of Jasher. He said, your glory, O Israel, lies slain upon your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath. Proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon, where the daughters of the Philistines will rejoice. The daughters of the uncircumcised will exult. You mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew or rain upon you, nor bounteous fields, for there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul, anointed with oil no more. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back, nor the sword of Saul return empty. Saul and Jonathan, beloved and lovely, in life and in death they were not divided. They were swift, swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. O daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothe you with crimson in luxury, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan lies slain upon your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Greatly beloved were you to me. Your love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen, and the weapons of war perished. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Psalm 130 begins on page 784. We will read it responsively. Out of the depths have I called to you, O Lord, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears consider well the voice of my supplication. For there is forgiveness with you, therefore you shall be feared. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. With him there is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all their sins.
Praise to you, Lord Christ. We all like to listen to familiar things. TV programs where we know the characters music by our favorite singers and composers, games that we learned to play when we were young. But what is familiar to our ears may be heard differently to somebody who's new to that music or on the scene. What is comforting to us might be disturbing to others. And what we glide over as a story ingrained in our hearts may give somebody new to it a brand new insight. The reading today from the second book of Samuel is one of those cases. The life of David is well known. How he was chosen by God's prophet to become the leader of Israel, even when he was a young boy, just tending sheep. How he took his slingshot and killed Goliath, the giant soldier of the enemies. How he played the harp and danced and wrote psalms. There are also other portions of David's life less remembered, such as how he seduced another man's wife and then had him killed. But today's section about David's life comes up about every three years in our lectionary, and it probably sounds familiar. The Israelites have fought a battle against the Philistines and have been routed. David is saved, but Saul, the king of Israel, has been killed, as has his son, Jonathan. Jonathan and David were very close. And in this reading, David laments the death of the king, and especially the death of his companion. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Greatly beloved were you to me. Your love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. Now, most people don't give that a second thought. A gay person, however, will hear that and think, God's anointed, loved another man, it's written down in the Bible, and God's okay with that? That verse, and others like it in the Bible, can be seen as an entree back into church for gays and lesbians and others and to a life of faith for the sort of people who, for many years, were shunned by organized religion, even for a period, this denomination. These days, LGBTQ people are welcome without question in the Episcopal Church and many other denominations, but not all. And that is because our understanding that the Word of God is for everyone not just a select few. It is not a rule book for a special club. It is not a confirmation of the status quo. The Bible is a holy invitation to any type of person who is not the norm. 
God speaks to everyone because everyone is a child of God. An upsetting thought to people who believe that God made them better than anyone else. As John Paul II said so many times, God has a preferential option for the poor. And scripture shows that God's prophets have consistently proclaimed freedom to the lost and the trapped, rather than congratulation to the powerful and wealthy. In fact, the powerful and wealthy have usually tried to squelch the good news. When African men, women, and children were stolen from their homelands and brought to this hemisphere to be slaves, they were also converted, willingly or not, to Christianity. And lest any of those enslaved persons get any ideas about freedom and equality, those businessmen mutilated the Bible and cut out the chapters and references that showed Moses leading the Hebrew slaves out of bondage in Egypt and into a promised land where they could thrive. The word of God was often twisted, even hidden, to justify a continuing state of affairs that enabled those who were on top of the economic ladder to stay there, to keep those who were at the bottom of the pile in their place down there. Anyone with ears to listen can understand that God shows no partiality. Take today's story, gospel story from Mark as an example. To look at it in one way, it is two stories about Jesus' healing powers, even to the extent of raising the dead back to life. But look at it instead in this context. If God intended for his son to conserve the exi existing structures of society, we would be hearing more stories in the Bible about how Jesus counseled kings and helped farmers and listened to rabbis and otherwise supported the men who were in charge. We all know from reading the Bible that this is not the case. In Mark's fifth chapter, some of which we, I just read, Jesus' healing power helped a woman who had a particularly female problem. But why not a story about he healing some farmer whose ox stepped on his foot? Why bother telling a story about a woman? And Jesus also brought back to life a little girl in a society where she was just a financial liability until she got married off. Again, why not tell a story about how a rabbi's son was revived? Why should the chroniclers of Jesus' life be concerned with something as inconsequential as a female child? Unless they meant to call our attention to it. And that's because there are no distinctions in God's eyes among his creation. He sent his son to redeem the world, not just the men, or the white folks, or the heterosexuals, or any other slice of society we may, we may choose to divide ourselves into. It is all God's handiwork. We are all his creation, even the misfits and the out of the ordinary among us. This is why we need to listen to God's voice all the time lest we think that what was said once upon a time has no bearing on a world that has progressed over the millennia. One of the arguments against women's ordination way back when was that Jesus called 12 men as his disciples, but no women. Now a number of retorts have been made in response to that, such as Jesus called 12 Jewish men, and why aren't we still following that practice? But if we listen to the words of the Gospels more carefully, we know that Jesus may have called 12 men as his close companions, but many more, including women, follow him. At one point in the Gospels, our Lord visited the house of his friends, and there Martha did all the food prep for the guests, while her sister Mary 
sat at Jesus' feet, and listened to his words with the rest of the guys. That would seem to indicate that women are welcomed by Jesus into his inner, inner circle of students. And whatever his relationship with his dozen male friends were, immediately after his resurrection from the dead, it was to Mary Magdalene and a few other women that Jesus showed himself. We see that, every, that scene every Sunday here at St. John's in the window over the altar. Jesus and two angels and Mary. They were chosen to be the bearers of the good news on purpose. The story of God's love for his, his creation is told by his faithful followers, but it is heard and seen through a variety of filters. For example, our culture gives us a Christ child who was born in a manger, sheltered from the snow. It's certainly romantic, but the reality is that an average, the average nightly low temperature in that area of the world is about 45 degrees, much too warm for any snow. The mid-19th century conception of Christmas by Charles Dickens and Thomas Nast has a greater influence on our view of that marvelous event than do the words of the Gospels themselves. And that's okay. How we connect to our Maker is not a concern of God's, so much as that we actually do make the connection with Him. The Son was sent to be among us to lead us back to the heavenly kingdom. All of Jesus' teaching and healing points to that, to bringing people to God, not turning them away. The problem with organized religion comes when it tries to deny others a path to eternal life, or deny people the opportunity to worship their creator. We do not need to be guardians of the faith. We need to be proclaimers of the faith. God doesn't need our protection. God wants all of his children to return to his side. That is what he asks of us to bring in, not to separate out. As followers of Christ, we are supposed to live out our lives as faithful witnesses to what our Lord taught. What Jesus taught was that everyone was of God. Every leper, every Samaritan, every outcast. Even every Pharisee and Sadducee. Jesus did not exclude them. He simply called on them to change their ways because the division of God's people was neither their right nor their calling. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, like us, were just called to love their neighbors in all their varying conditions and lifestyles. In these current days, we are asked to listen to the word of God to hear it in ways that unite us to our maker. We shouldn't use scripture to confirm us where we are as if we were perfect enough already. And we don't need it to sort people into categories that, respond, that correspond with our neuroses. We need the word to make us and the world we live in a better place. So if a drag queen shows up to worship here at St. John's, well, just push over and make some room for him or her. They, they're obviously here for the same reason you are, which is to, to connect to God through any of the avenues that God offers us. And who knows what part of the Bible, or the service, or your attitude that may be. Amen. Amen.
We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate for the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and this kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken to the prophets. We believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Chip, our bishop, and all bishops, for Ron, our priest, and Keith, our deacon, for the presbyters, deacons, seminarians, religious, and all who minister in Christ's name, for this holy gathering, and for the people of God in every place. Lord, have mercy. For those living in troubled lands, such as Nicaragua, Haiti, El Salvador, Honduras, Mexico, and Venezuela, Israel, Gaza, and the West Bank, Iraq, Iran, Lebanon, and Syria, Nigeria, Yemen, Somalia, and South Sudan, North Korea, and South Korea, India, Myanmar, and Afghanistan. For all nations, tri peoples, tribes, clans, and families. Lord, have mercy for an end to racism and the abuse of God's children, that we may live together with charity and in wholeness. Lord, have mercy. For those in positions of public trust, especially Joe, our president, Philip, our governor, Dennis, the mayor of this community, and the leaders of all our communities, for police officers, firefighters, first responders, and those who guard the peace, for justice and compassion in all cities and towns. Lord, have mercy. For all those in danger and need, for the sick and the suffering, especially Greg Gibson, Lily Altamura, Laura Hasselbrink, Randy and Claire Rokiski, Pamela, Christine, Lee Henderson, Kyle Ferris, Michael Watts, Betty Baumberger, George Mullen, Marsha Bauer, Walt and Joanne Ivis, Christine Massey, Paul Thibodeau, Bill, Harold Willard, Tony Davis, as well as those known to you. For the poor, the beleaguered, and the oppressed, for travelers, refugees, and prisoners. Lord, have mercy. For the dying and the dead, in particular, Charlotte Faye Dennis, Hazel Jane Schaub, Jeffrey J. Yingst, Alexis Smith, Christina Walker, Jose Garcia Cruz. And for those who mourn, Lord have mercy. For the people of this parish, for those celebrating birthdays this week, Jonathan Cutlow, Ava Tipton, Devron Robinson, Liliana Benitez, David Matthews, 
Susan Kiernan, Michael Crystal, Roseanne Brown, Carol Boyer, Justin Matias, Connie Van Arsdale. For those celebrating their wedding anniversary this week, William and Sherry Fox, Carl and Colleen Spilaric, George and Candy Moen, Daniel and Kathleen Conseco, Walter and Joanne Ivis, Peter and Christine Miller, Ralph and Mary McMullen, Bob and Buffy Disco, Paul and Annie Akins, Kelly and Brian Hamer. For those we Miss Whitmore. For those connected to our parish family who are serving in our armed forces, Nicholas Lofton, James Cerisi, Brandon Akins, Ryan Cook, Jordan Greenip, Bertie Ferguson, Will Schaub, Trey Robinson, Raymond Campos, Ryan Finelli, Jerry Perez, Bob Scott, David Jones. For ourselves, our families, friends, and companions, and all those we love. Lord, have mercy. Lifting our voices with all creation, with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Blessed Francis, Blessed Pauline Murray, priest and civil rights activist, Blessed John the Evangelist, our patron, and all the saints, let us offer ourselves and one another to the living God through Christ. To you, O Lord, generous and life-giving God, whose Son became poor for our sake, hear the prayers we offer this day and pour your abundance on all your people through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we, we confess that we have sinned against, against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins, O our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. My brothers and sisters, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Peace. Peace, Anne. Peace, Keith. Peace, Leo. Peace, Bruce. The congregation may be seated. A special welcome to uh, newcomers today. We are delighted that you're here. Please know that all baptized Christians are welcome to receive communion. This is not an Episcopal table. Indeed, this is the Lord's table. We'd like to uh, note that next Sunday you are in the good hands of Father Andrew Calandrello, former Roman Catholic priest who came to the Holy Land, the Episcopal Church. He will be in our midst, and I know that you will warmly welcome him with cool cups of water, assisting the ushers to open and close the uh, windows and turn fans on and off. That would be wonderful. I will be here for the two middle Sundays in July, and then the final Sunday in July, I'll be away again. So I hope to spend some time just relaxing. This has been a tough go, and um, I'm grateful to God for the opportunity to serve Christ and his church, but it's also important to go to the mountaintop and just rest and say my prayers and take a nap. When this whole pandemic began, we were like everyone else, like you, unsure which way to turn. But ultimately, we all turn to God. And in the Diocese of New Jersey, under the leadership of Bishop Chip Stokes, there was the um, development of a diocesan task force. 
and subsequently a St. John's Church task force for reopening. We, of course, closed immediately like all the other churches did. And then after we put together our proposal to open our church again, um, we in fact did that. Then the numbers were running high. Again, we had to close. We closed before Christmas. And then we finally opened again for in-person worship on Mother's Day. At this time, I'd like to invite Karen Whitmore, Never Ray Fox, and Deacon Keith McCoy to come forward. The St. John's Task Force of Karen Neva, Deacon Keith, and Bob Fox um, all have been laboring hard in the vineyard on your behalf. The theme in the Diocese of New Jersey has been and continues to be, this is how we love one another. So at this time, I would like to get, offer each of our people here um, a token of our thanks. And I know that you will join me in thanking God for the gift that we have in this group of people who have been meeting faithfully nearly every week since this pandemic began. Will you join me? You may be seated. Again, we welcome back uh, Bruce Shu as our guest organist. Welcome back, Bruce. And Leo Campos will be um, offering um, hymn number 419 on our behalf in just a few moments. Our communion hymn, communion hymn is 567, 567. That we will sing during communion. And give himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God.
All things come to thee, O Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For by water and the Holy Spirit, you have made us a new people in Jesus Christ, our Lord, to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate for the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, and we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection unto your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where with Mary, Joseph, Francis, John, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him and the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. The God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect to do his will, that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Hymn number 411. <laughs>